Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This week, you will just have me in the chair, um, and I'm pretty excited to, to get into this. And one of the things that I wanted to tackle today was maybe an idea for moving forward um, where I'm going to deep dive into a topic. Um, I was able to research and look into it and you know, got some some good notes to share with everybody and to guide the conversation that I'm going to have. Um, but today I really wanted to hone in on something that I've been experiencing um, a lot or having conversations about a lot with um, people who are considering getting into mental skills training. And of course, the conversation always ends up going towards, you know, how much does it cost? What's the value? Is it worth it? And I think the reason for this, it's it's not a bad thing, right? Money is important. And with everything going on, it's reasonable to expect that we're asking these questions, right? Is it worth it? Is this what I need to be spending my money on? And we're still in a place where mental skills training and psychological training in general is relatively speaking kind of new still, right? Um, a lot of people say that sports psychology in general got its start in the 90s. Um, and so, yeah, very new. And one of the things that I really wanted to break down was kind of why we are where we're at right now in elite level athletics, which is really starting to turn our attention to the mental side of sport. You've heard us say on uh, this show, um, us meaning Taylor and I, um, say on the show countless times that sport is 95 to 98% mental. Um, yet up until this point, um, we have devoted the majority of our time to the physical side of sports. I think about how much, you know, strength and conditioning has evolved. And even as an elite athlete myself, how much time I devoted to physical training and how much I valued it. And we can certainly see how much we value strength and conditioning as a society when we look at, you know, one of the necessary resources that every athletics department has. It's a gym, right? We have strength and conditioning coaches. We have experts in the field who lead our teams and our athletes through the improvement of their physical body so that hopefully it will increase their performance. Um, and while some schools are starting to uh, advocate for getting sports psychologists or mental performance coaches, it is still on the side of if you have it, it's great, but it's not a necessity yet. Whereas, you know, having a strength and conditioning coach is pretty necessary at this at this point. Um, and one of the things that I read while I was going through all of the research um, that I was doing earlier today is going to lay this out in a really simple yet fancy sounding kind of way. And it's that humans are considered not only as a physical organism, but also as a psychological entity with emotions, thoughts, feelings, and spirituality. And that came from Altintus and Akalam um, in an article called Mental Training and High Performance. It lays it out pretty bare, right? Yes, we are a physical thing, um, but we also have this other side of us, the psychological entity piece that consists of those things that we call emotions, thoughts, feelings, and spirituality. And the interesting part about that side of us, which is no less important than the physical side, is that the physical side we can see, we can feel, we can hear, we can touch, we can manipulate. But the mental side, the psychological side of us is harder to do because we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't really, you know, interact a whole lot with it aside from how that psychological entity comes into the environments that we're in through how we vocalize our thoughts, through the conversations that we have with ourselves, through our ability to communicate where our self-awareness is at or where our belief systems are. So it's on us to be able to have the self-awareness, to understand the psychological side of it. Whereas if you're looking at your physical body, a strength and conditioning coach can tell you how you're moving wrong. You don't need to know that, right? A strength and conditioning coach can tell you what muscles you need to strengthen based on how you're moving. You can go in and get a physical assessment. And it's pretty 
bear to see what needs work based on that physical assessment. And yes, we have mental assessments. We can talk to counselors. We can do all this work that involves the mental side, but it is still a little bit more subjective because we can't necessarily point to that one thing that's going on. It's a little bit more nuanced from person to person. And it absolutely comes out differently for everybody, for every athlete, for every human being. So when we start to think about, you know, why mental skills training and, and even physical training um, started to become so prevalent in sports today and why, you know, we call professional athletes elite level athletes, we really want to look at why was our performance or where was that shift where we started looking at sports as how do we maximize performance, right? When did it shift from this is a hobby that people engage in to, no, this is this is a moneymaker and we are focused on creating higher levels of performance. And I think we can look back to the history of sports, right? The um, introduction of sport broadcasting over the radio in the 1920s and then eventually over television in the 1950s. And what this did is it essentially created household names of athletes, right? People were able to see them or hear about them on a daily basis. They became really interested in it. And when you, you know, originally just had some people going to watch in person, now you had, you know, nationally broadcasted either radio or TV shows of these athletes doing this thing that they were really, really good at. So teams and leagues um, started to get viewed by hundreds of thousands of people um, thanks to you no know, expensive broadcasting deals. So now we're seeing an influx of money coming into sport, right? Whereas maybe it was just donors who really liked the sport, who played it once, they're giving money so that, you know, people can do it or doing it for free, essentially, because they enjoyed the game to now we're at a point where we're seeing an influx of money, where money is being pumped into the sport. And we're looking for, hey, we need to figure out a way to make this money back now. Right. So we have these expensive broadcasting deals. We're monetizing sport and creating a commodity out of it. And with money comes expectations. Right. I think about, you know, the push for thrilling games or for the superstars to show up and play their best. And ultimately, from a broadcasting standpoint, when you're investing that much money, you're saying we need you to do this as an athlete or as a team because we want people to stay tuned into our broadcast. We want more people to watch. We want to make more money right? because it goes back to the network who's investing that money. So essentially what we're doing is we're creating the mass spectator sport, right? We are creating a sport where everybody can find a way to hear it or watch it, where everybody has the opportunity to read about, hear about, or watch some player like Babe Ruth play in New York. Um, there's a really cool uh, article uh, from a company called Coffee or Die, which um, is a subsidiary of Black Rifle Coffee that put out a really, really interesting article on this. I'll put it in the show notes in case you're interested in learning more about, you know, basically how sports started to become what we know them as today. Um, and an athlete like Babe Ruth was kind of at the forefront of that. But I guess the big piece of this or the big takeaway from the monetization of sports is that with great amount of money on the line, comes a great amount of expectation, right? Because we're talking about investment of something that's precious to people um, and has a lot of value on it. So if we fast forward to today, the superstars are now the ideal. Um, they're the idols that young kids in sport aspire to, not just in skill, but in recognition and fame and salary and everything that comes with that, right? These young kids see these uh, elite superstar athletes playing on TV TV and hearing about their salaries and they say, I want to do that, right? Oh, I love the sport. I want to do that. I want to be like them. Right? And it's the, <laughs> it's kind of funny because you start playing because maybe you love the game. You have joy when you play it. Um, and eventually for a lot of athletes that actually, it fades at some point, right? Because we get so hyper fixated on 
the lifestyles that our idols live, the type of notoriety that they have, and how we envision getting that for ourselves, right? And ultimately, that's what pushes a lot of elite level athletes to get to that level is wanting to have the big salary to be able to play their sport as a living, wanting to be able to take care of their families, whatever that may be. And we lose sight on the fact that most of the time we started playing the sport because we loved it, but because it's now monetized and it has all of this value attached to being quote unquote, the best at it. We then look to all of those indicators to tell us, Hey, are we doing well? And if we're expected to perform well, we then understand that, well, I have to do something in order to perform that way. So whereas, you know, you look at some of the MLB baseball players of the 1920s versus the MLB baseball players of today, or even the golfers of the 1920s versus the golfers of today, you can see the difference in physicality that is now a part of every elite level sport of every sport that's played on a professional level. You can see how strength and conditioning has become a part of sport. It's no longer seen as, you know, just an accessory. It's very much a part of sport because again, if you're expected to perform well, you have to find ways to set yourself apart from the crowd. The evolution of strength and conditioning and um, how it's impacted the way that athletes not only look, but also, you know, the ceiling that they have for their performance and, and what they're able to do skill wise for golf, how far they're able to drive a ball or for baseball, how many home runs they're able to hit, how fast they're able to run the bases, how fast they're able to track down a ground ball. The physicality has changed the sport and it makes it way more thrilling to watch when you think about it. Um, but now that we're seeing this, you know, we've seen the evolution of strength and conditioning. Now I think we're starting to get into like, what's the next step? And my argument and where sports in general are going is that the next step is the mental side. And there's an interesting um, quote that I found from another article where it was talking about how athletes essentially have to figure out a way to be physically, technically, tactically and socially ready, in addition to psychologically ready and strong. Now at Elite, we use the four terms mentally, emotionally, physically, and tactically. Now, half of those are on the mental side, and half of them are on the physical side. But I can also make the argument that your tactical ceiling, your ceiling for the skills that you can adapt to, um, the new skills that you can learn, the ones that you can master has a huge, huge piece to do with your psychological readiness and your ability to see yourself doing those things, to have confidence in yourself to achieve them. So the natural progression, you know, athletes became more physically capable and ready to handle the stress of sport and competition. Um, they became more tactically sound, right? You're starting to see real experts in the field. So skill acquisition is higher. And the way that I kind of draw this out for everybody to see, I'll maybe hold it up to the screen here. Here's a good little graph to kind of show that as your physical capability increases, if we were to put it on a graph, let's put physical capability on this arm and skill acquisition on this arm. And the way that I drew it out is that as your physical capability increases, or maybe your strength or your speed or your agility, whatever it is, increases, you might have the ability to acquire a new skill. And then as you acquire that new skill, maybe there's a little bit of a pause in skill acquisition. And then as your physical capability increases again, you acquire a new skill. Then there's a pause. As your physical um, capability improves more, you acquire a new skill, right? That's what I see it as being. And at some point in this journey, you're going to hit the, the sort of moment in time where your physical capability is at its peak. You're as strong as you can be, you're as fast as you can be. And then your skill acquisition is going to take a hit, right? And whether that's because 
you made a mistake somewhere or you're just hitting a roadblock with how to get this next skill, whatever that is, you're going to hit that roadblock. And the mental side of sport is what's eventually going to get you through or over that roadblock. The cutting edge for performance maximization was physical readiness because we weren't doing a lot for it initially, right? And now that we've gone through the process of building strength, increasing speed, developing greater endurance, increasing flexibility and agility and preventing injury, now that that's become the norm for elite level athletes, everyone is doing this at the highest levels. The cutting edge is mental. If there's one thing that's going to separate all of those athletes that are doing the exact same thing, or in some way, shape or form, they're strengthening, they're conditioning, they're, you know, doing prehab and rehab to make sure that their body stays healthy. That next cutting edge is going to be the mental side of the game. Because, you know, if you're an elite level athlete, you understand how important the conversation that you're having in your head is when it comes to being able to perform at your best. But don't, you know, trust my word on that. Let's get into some of the studies. Um, So various studies have shown that mental skills training protocols or the use of mental tools um, significantly increases the athlete's level of performance. So in one study by Patrick uh, Herkaiko at the... um, Patrick and Herkaiko at the University of Manitoba, not sure if I said that last name right, Um, runners were able to complete a 1600 meter run faster and increase levels of endurance after using mental skills training. And they were able to demonstrate a positive relationship between the usage of mental skills tools and performance. So basically saying the more mental skills tools that the athletes used, um, the better their performance was, right? So pretty compelling you're able to run a race faster when you are using mental skills tools. Um, Self-talk has also been shown significant in terms of increasing performance. So when we're talking about self-talk, we're essentially talking about the conversation that you're having in your own head about your ability to complete something. Sounds like, yes, I can do this, or, oh, I'm going to fail. Mahoney and Abner in 1977, so quite a while ago, um, they saw that positive self-talk was more present in qualifying U.S. gymnasts than those who didn't qualify, right? So the gymnasts that were able to perform to the level, um, whether that that was their peak or if it was just good enough to help them qualify, they were able to hit that standard. And those athletes were using more positive self-talk than the athletes who weren't able to qualify. And then another study um, done by people that I was actually uh, fortunate enough to be taught by in grad school, um, Judy Van Ralty and Britt Brewer, along with Al Pettipaw, found that tennis players who used spoken positive talk during matches scored more points than players who didn't use positive self-talk. So in this study, it's kind of cool because they're talking about people who actively um, outwardly said these things, right? So maybe they're having a conversation with themselves on the court, whether it's, you know, before they serve or after they make a mistake, they're outwardly saying like, hey, you've got this, don't worry about it. You can do this. And they're comparing it not to people who are actively saying anything negative. They're just comparing it to people who aren't saying anything out loud, which is pretty cool. So clearly there's something going on with this psychological entity that we started talking about at the beginning of this conversation. This is the side of the human being that we, you know, still really don't know a whole lot about. The brain is a very complex organ and, you know, we could get into a philosophical discussion that could last hours about what the human consciousness is and all that stuff. But we know that we have a mindset, we have a perspective on how we see things. And that has a play or a huge role on the impact of athletic performance, right? We see how self-talk, the way that we talk to ourselves about our performance is really important. And we see that mental skills tools, whether that's honing your focus or setting a goal is able to actually take off seconds 
from a 1600 meter run, right? So we know that the mental side is playing some sort of role here. That's not to be argued. So how are mental skills training protocols impacting athletes' psychological variables, let's call them? Um, and what are these psychological variables? They're your emotions, your ability to attention and how, wow, your ability to hone your attention in, um, your ability to focus on maybe the present moment or something that's right in front of you. It's your mental resiliency. It's the level of motivation that you have. It's your mental clarity, right? These are all of your psychological variables that absolutely play a part in your ability to perform at your peak. And there's two kind of schools of mental skills training that we talk about. One of them is mindfulness-based and the other is psychological skills. So when I think about mindfulness-based, I think about you know being able to practice self-awareness. What am I feeling right now and why am I feeling that way? Mindfulness might also um, include breathing techniques and honing your focus back inward. Um, whereas psychological skills, that could have anything to do from goal setting to how do I um, learn to bounce back from mistakes? What does my mental recovery look like, right? And yes, they can be used interchangeably in some areas, but the goal either way is to train our ability to keep those mental and psychological variables, our emotions, our attention and focus, our resiliency, our motivation, and our mental clarity in a green area, right? Think green light go. It's telling us, hey, when these are in, in the green, we're good to go. And a lot of external things in sport or in life try to pull those mental variables into a red area. And we're thinking about some of those external variables. It's the mistakes that we make. It's our focus on the outcomes. Um, it's ideas of, you know, I should be able to do this or I have to do this. Our parents are a huge external variable or our peers, our self-confidence or our esteem which leads into, you know, our perceived ability to complete a task. There's a really interesting article on fear of failure, um, which I'm sure that all of us can acknowledge that at some point in our lives, we've been afraid of failing because of what failing con constitutes. It's the right word. This study found that the fear of failure being present in young athletes increased their negative emotions, reduced their self-perception and their motivation. So let's break that down. Being afraid to fail. So having their, that psychological variable of attention and focus being pulled into a red area, because if we're afraid to fail, we're focused on the outcome as opposed to the present moment. It dropped their levels of confidence, and their levels of motivation. And when we don't feel confident, so here we go, emotion being pulled into a red area where we don't feel confident and we don't feel motivated, what your body naturally is going to want to do is to run away from whatever that situation is. So we start to engage in avoidance behaviors. And it sounds like a fancy thing, but in avoidance behaviors that I think of um, for myself personally, I remember when my self-confidence was in a really bad place as an athlete, if I was in practice and I was getting beat in a drill, I would just bail and I would stand up and act like I didn't care. That's an avoidance behavior because by doing that, I was allowing myself the ability to say, well, I didn't fail. I quit essentially. Right. So we engage in avoidance behaviors that is bailing on a drill or bailing in a game or think of a gymnast bailing on a maneuver that they're trying to do. Is that helping us perform to our peak? No, absolutely not. Right. So just in that one example, you're able to see how all of these external factors have the ability to take all of those psychological variables that are so important in our ability to execute on a skill or to play to our best, how they have the ability 
to tank our performance as opposed to improve it. Now, what mental skills training gives you the ability to do is to keep those external variables in check or to keep your attention focused on internal variables that allow you to feel like you're in control, that allow you to focus on the present moment, that ultimately put those psychological variables into a green state. Now, it's interesting to talk about all of this because to me, yeah, it seems secondhand, right? And all of this makes a lot of sense to me because I've spent a lot of time learning about it and, and training and working with athletes on this different stuff. But the one thing that I see is that the older generations of people still have a hard time buying into it. And like I said earlier, it makes a lot of sense. We are really still at the cusp of understanding the full scope of the human brain and the psyche and mindset and understanding that it has an impact on the way that we perform, whether that's at school, um, as athletes, in life, at work, in general, right? The thing that runs the show is the brain. And if you're having a negative conversation with yourself about your ability to accomplish something, or if your confidence is in the gutter, or if somebody has told you your entire life that you're never going to be able to do it, the conversation that's going on there is going to send out a series of chemicals from your body or from your brain to your body that are basically going to tell your body physically, no, we're not doing this. So when people ask me if this work is valuable, yes, it's valuable. When they ask me about how they can do it, you got to get a mental skills coach. You need to talk to a sports psychologist. You need to be able to, first and foremost, have a conversation with yourself about where your mindset is at. And shameless plug, I'm going to throw in that there is a great course that we have at Elite that allows you to cover all of those bases, and it's the Brain Training for Athletes program. It's all online. It gives you the ability to have that conversation with yourself, to discover where your mindset's at and why it is that way, while also giving you all of the proactive stuff, the things on goal setting, the material on building mental resiliency. How do you bounce back from a mistake? It gives you all of that. You can take it at your own pace. You can do it with peers, but you need to start doing the work. You need to be able to have that conversation with yourself first before you're going to start to see those increases in performance. Because physically, you might be ready. But if your brain and your mindset is not in support of the goals that you're setting for yourself, your physical body can't do it on its own. I think I'm going to end it on that. So if you have any questions about the value of mental skills training after today, Find me at EliteHighPerformance.com under Athlete Coaching and schedule a free 30-minute consult with either myself or Taylor. We would both love to have a conversation with you about this. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the Brain Training for Athletes program, you can also find all of the information you need to know on EliteHighPerformance.com or you can feel free to email myself or Taylor, which our emails are just lauren at elitehighperformance.com or taylor at elitehighperformance.com and we would love to have a conversation with you about it so that's it for today everybody thank you for tuning into this solo episode and as always please leave um a rating or a comment let me know if you liked this structure of episode where we're just riffing off on research and kind of diving into a sing single topic here um, if you liked it, let me know. If you didn't, also let me know. Not worried if you didn't like it. We'll find something else to do. Um, but thanks again for listening. And I will see you all back here with Taylor next week.